Hi, everybody. It's Angela here again. I'm so excited to have this discussion. We have been wanting to record this video for a long time, Flo. So let me just quickly introduce who's here with me, and then I'm going to allow you to introduce yourself more than I can do. But I met Flo, gosh, back in 2020 or 2021, something like that, during the pandemic. You had found my my doctoral work, and you interviewed me for a, a Puttyverse uh, podcast. Podcast it was, yeah. And then um, you ended up getting a doctorate, and we worked together. I was your the supervisor for your yeah. academic research <laughs> as it pertains to polymathy, and we're friends, we're colleagues, and we also have young daughters around the same age, which has been interesting because we're both academics in the polymathy space raising young young girls young children so i think you're an amazing person and such a strong polymath and i'm so glad that you're in the polymathy space so that's my introduction of flow but please please boast and brag and tell the truth of your background i'd love to share with viewers and listeners <laughs> who you are thanks so much angela i'm i'm really grateful uh, that you have me um uh, especially after all the research we did and all the things we found and uh, our stay in London together with Barry James was beautiful and, and, and so much ideas going around. So uh, what, what to tell about me? So um, I'm a typical mid-European Austrian, you know, eighth generation of a highly mixtured background, um, Danube monarchy and so, you know, so many things going on in my uh, genetical background too. <laughs> so I, I think uh, some of the stuff submerged now and then. Um, actually, well, my background is highly colorful. Um, it, it starts with uh, the year 2000, 2001, when I started out at a, as, a, as a science journalist and medical journalist, uh, then moved on to, goodness me, what did I then? I had a, a training as illustrator, um, then I was uh, for the for the telephone summer region, uh, public relations, head of public relations. Uh, then I had my own magazine around 2007, 2008, where I put together science and and you know uh, uh, writing stuff, creative writing stuff for for uh, young adults, which was a highly uh, a well really well written and, and, and well edited uh, journal actually uh then poof, what's next goodness me then i started medicine um then i proceeded and and uh developed to no i not developed yeah developed yes developed to my understanding that uh, after i seen enough of medicine i was more interested in population health sciences so i went to london and did my masters in public health at drew hampton uh from there i moved on and did a a master in business administration in Cambridge about healthcare marketing because I was interested in about how to sell or how to uh, bring health to people, uh, how to tell the story about health because there is a misunderstanding of health. Many think it is a product, but actually it is a process. Uh, in, in between, I did a, a master certificate at Cornell University on healthcare leadership. Um, finally ended up in Edinburgh with a PhD uh, in telemedicine, and yes, yeah, somewhere in between, I had so much material about polymaths and about, um, you know, what these people can bring and uh, to 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 an organization, to an, an, an professional environment with their ideas, and that was the point where I thought I have to dive deeper into it is because I'm one myself, and it took a long time to accept this. Um, Primarily because here in, in, in let's call it the, the, the Dach region, the German speaking countries, everything is hyper specialized, you know, everyone has his little box. Uh, and right now you can't even decide the color of the box anymore. So <laughs> actually, you just get your box and be happy with it. Um, but as we see now after the pandemic, uh, which kind of really put off the color of the canvas and allowed us to watch the functionalities and the mechanics, the gears running inside the system um, and the demographic change, few and few youngsters around. Uh, we finally understood that it is firstly 
the, the world is more complex than we ever thought. And the other thing is that the young people around now have to have much more skills than 20 or 30 years ago, because uh, the retirement wave hits every country around the world. Uh, and the youngsters have to do three, four, five things now in parallel, but are actually educated and trained for their little box. Um, and yeah, and then I finally ended up like, um, it's it's about narratives. You know, it's, it's everything is about narratives, the stories we are telling ourselves. So, and I hope it is my far, last master and my last degree. Well, I started a master now in Edinburgh about future narratives and how we can change the, the basic understanding of what stories are we telling ourselves uh, with regards to, you know, climate change, uh, nutrition, health, all this stuff that is for, our, for, for us as people and as a community or as a society, highly relevant to survive. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's kind of me. And I think I did it under three minutes, right? <laughs> that was great. Lo, <laughs> just by the way, how many degrees yeah. do you have? Right now? Uh, how many? One, the collection of degrees. Uh, they are there. <laughs> there's one, the two, three, four. And there is a second PhD. Uh, uh, there is the second uh, doctorate and the master are missing because I always I had this idea when I started out in 2011. I want to have such a par pyramid, you know, a triangle. And then I understood, oh, goodness me, how broad must the base be? Ah, goodness, then I need at least two masters or three. And then I said, ah, that doesn't work out, so I have to do two more. No, <laughs> just <kidding. laughs> You have multiple PhDs, multiple yes. master's degrees. I mean, it's just, wow, yeah. you have really been dedicated to learning. That's amazing. Um, Kind of. You know, the funny thing is, I didn't learn this in my home country, Austria. Because here it was just sitting and learn the books and give the right answers at the right moment. It was horrible when I went to Roehampton and had my first assignment. Because in the UK, everything is, I mean, the education system is brilliant. And they have completely different approaches in many fields. When I did a test in Austria at the university, it was mostly like ticking the boxes. Uh, in the UK, the, the public health master I did... I had to write an assignment. So I sat down and wrote this assignment, uh, submitted it. And then my next step was I had to talk to the supervisor. And it was like, oh, goodness me, what did I wrong? And he said, uh, sorry, I checked your assignment. What is this writing? And I said, yeah, that, that's my assignment. We saw what's, what, what's wrong with it. And he said, uh, yeah, it's absolute. It's catastrophic. It's a, I can't even give an F. It's, it's, I mean, where is your critical thinking? And I said, ah, yeah, critical thinking. Well, that's no one wants to see that in Austria. I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> so at the age of 30, 32, I had to re, uh, relearn learning. Mm. And it was wonderful how they did this with me because the first thing they, they asked me, what, learn, what type of learner you are? And I said, I have absolutely no idea. I never thought about that. And then they did some tests with me and said, oh, you're an auditive learner. I said, what in God's name is an auditive learner? Yeah, you have to listen to the whole stuff. So go home, buy an, I think it was an MP3 player back then, buy one uh, and record all your readings. Recall all the stuff you have to learn and have it in your ears wherever you go. So I did. Uh, and then the next time I understood, oh, wow, it's much easier to, 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 to follow up what I have to learn because I know now I'm an auditive learner. And the other thing they sent me to was learning techniques. And the very moment I understood that every learning technique pivots around narratives and stories, the next thing was, because I'm a tricky, you know, but tell no one, um, I took all the old uh, the old Star Trek movies and the old Star Trek series with Captain Kirk. And for every series, for every episode, I had a paper or something to learn. And I learned it with this, that the figures, the characters, they were talking to me, the certain situations. I just anchored uh, with the memory with the mnemonic techniques and um, Loki techniques and what out there. I anchored the whole episodes, uh, the whole uh, seasons, uh, with each uh, with each uh, thing XM I had to learn. And 
honestly, everything was uh, a B, a C, the worst, but it was always like A, B, because I just sat there and clicked on my favorite episode, and there every learning content was connected to a certain scene in the episode. And that's how I, how I relearned learning. And after I understood that, everything else was like, oh, just sit down, <laughs> check, okay, how, how, long is the, how long is the master studies? How much is to learn? How many modules are there? How many units are there? And which series is, or which, yeah, which serial is interesting enough and has enough episodes so I can fit everything in. And yeah, then Netflix was on. And I thought, oh my goodness, I can't study that much. <laughs> wow. I'm so impressed that you took the time to figure out how you learn best so you can make the most yeah. of your efforts. You and yeah. I, I just want to also point out, in addition to the collection of degrees that you have and continue to grow, you're starting a new master's here pretty soon. How many books or published articles have you, like, can you give listeners a sense of that? Good Lord. Um I, I, I had a time of, of uh, doing novels. I was a novelist mm -hmm. and short stories. Um, I think I have three anthologies with short short stories. One, two, three, four, five novels. Uh, three audiobooks. Something like this. I can't remember, honestly. Uh, because there are so many other ideas right now in my head when I talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and you're also a painter, an excellent painter. Yes. And what else? I mean, is there anything I'm missing to paint the picture um, of, of you? It's it's more like yeah, a painter uh, drawing uh, as an illustrator. I always was like in black whites, uh, and I'm so fascinated. Uh, I have this fear of color. Hmm. Okay, it doesn't make sense, but I have some kind of fear of color because when I see these masters in the galleries, what they did with color. I was like, I always feel like a caveman. And um, finally, I was surprised because I love all the charcoal stuff. And when I'm out, you know, I'm outdoors here. I'm often at the Danube River and then I do uh, some 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 fire, uh, campfire, and, and, and there I have my charcoal. And I start painting like with the charcoal, like a caveman. And it is so raw, so authentic. And it has so Real charcoal? Shades. I thought you would yeah, go to the store charcoal. and buy yeah. some product. To paint. Yeah, that too, that too, that, that too. too. Yeah, yeah. But so actually, I'm 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 working in charcoal, and I love it because you get dirty, and there you suddenly understand the black you put on the canvas is shadow, and the rest is light, and it's so fun when you're a polymath because you understand, oh, wherever I do just a shade of 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 grayish, this is this light light I don't know shadow of somewhere. And it suddenly becomes plastic, yeah. And it's yeah, maybe it's a contradiction, but uh, yeah, it's beautiful. And what else do I do? Playing the piano. Uh, but I have had it with all these uh, sit down and learn certain music. I play my own. Um, some say it's good, others love it. Uh, me myself, I need it. Music is for me some kind of you know. Uh, uh, emotional lightning rod when i learn or when i write something i have always music on um i just have this problem that i can't listen to english music anymore because i understand the text but when i suddenly understood that japanese do brilliant rock and roll and that uh, korean punk is great but i don't understand a word what they sing <laughs> just Keep it in the flow. Great you know? background music, great energy to inspire Absolutely. your writing and Absolutely. stuff. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. Honestly, and 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 uh, Indian electronic dance music. Good Lord, you can write like on speed. That's unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> and I need it when, when things pile up now and then, emotionally, uh, then I have to play piano because it's like really giving everything away to the wave, to the sound, to the frequencies. And after all, if you... Yeah, if you dig down deep enough in the universe and how the reality is done and how the reality exists, we are all frequencies. We are just waves. And I somehow feel happy when I can give my emotions to those waves and 
maybe a little waltz or maybe a little jig or whatsoever. I play, I play, fantasize with the music. And yeah, after two hours, I'm completely, yeah, leveled. Yeah. It's brilliant. And I know where you live in Vienna, like they're known for having a, a musical culture. Or yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. not in Vienna, in Austria. Sorry. Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah, I was yeah, thinking yeah. of the city, but the country you live in is known to be a very musical country. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. But somehow I have my problems with this as well, because uh, how can I put it nicely? Um, listening to Mozart a thousand times in your life and then suddenly understand, OK, yeah, he was a genius. Yeah, he was good. But the time he wrote this was there, there, there was a certain message when he wrote this, you know, and we are in the 21st century. It's still nice to listen, it's still wonderful, but we have, I mean, there are so many, un, uh, um, how can I put it, there, there are so many underrated folk musicians around from the, uh, from Hungary or mm. Poland or something, who do brilliant with Mozart, but in a complete new style, like brass music or gypsy brass music. Now that's fascinating because they live now. They are filters of the now time. Mm. Mozart was a filter of his back time, but they are filters of the now time. And there are so many different, that's really, wow, I get the goosebumps. That's yeah, brilliant. I just got the goosebumps too. Like the this idea that a human is a filter to understand current time. Like that's a cool way to think of it. Um, okay, so we have shared some of your background, your capacities, your versatility, your ability to learn, unlearn, relearn, think your significant player in the polymathy studies space. Um, and you're such a strong polymath yourself. Okay, so we've established that. Now we're going to shift gears to our girls. Yeah. Valentina and Lily. Okay. Um, so Valentina. first off, I just want to ask you, and I'd also like to share myself, like, what are your fundamental beliefs behind how you parent? Like, what do you believe about the role that a parent should play in a child's life? Okay. If you want, um, I can go first. It, if you need more time. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I'll go first. So my underpinning beliefs behind how I mother my daughter are that I, I don't believe she's my possession or my property. I'm like her shepherd, her guardian, even though I created her. Um, she's her own person and I want her to thrive. I want her to have the best possible life. I want her to know unconditional love. I want to be a source of that in her life. And I view my role not to make her anything other than help her be herself. That is the basic belief structure I have behind how I parent. And so everything I do is through the lens of how can I help my daughter explore and express her authentic self in healthy ways. And so part of my role as a parent has been to explore or expose her to different facets of learning and life and experience and fun and exploration and play so that she can figure out what she likes. And it doesn't take much. She can figure it out pretty quick, right? Um, but to, yeah, I really view my role as to help her become all of herself. Brilliant. Put. I can remember when I had Valentina in my hands first, she was two hours old. And I saw in her little face and had just one, this one thought, you know, the first child always looks like the father. Yeah, and there was this first thought, oh, my God, please let her look like your mother, not me. <laughs> this poor girl. No, yeah, that was the first thought. But this um, evolved because it, the second thought was she's already finished. There is a finished personality in my hands, a character in my arms. She's already done with all her, uh, with, with the nerves and her heart bumping and her brain and what she wants, what she doesn't want. It's already there. And I don't think I have to write to play God once more <laughs> because I have to be grateful that God did all this. Uh, and uh, I don't have the right to shape. I don't have the right to cut or fine trim or whatsoever. As you say, I am the guardian. I take her by my hand and support her. 
tell her about stuff that's not good and the rest she has to find out for herself. So it was like, after I understood um, that she is already a Finnish personality, I focused on what we as polymaths somehow do naturally, uh, um, pattern recognition, what stuff is going on permanently, what does she like, what does she doesn't like, and remember that, or write it down. I had a diary back then, just about, well, what she's doing, what she's not doing, to get an idea. Uh, and then after one, two, three years, when you see that things suddenly uh, fit together, uh, yeah, that they that there are pa patterns uh, uh, merging, then you get a better idea. Okay, here I can help her. And uh, yeah, so as you say, um, the first thought was like she's already finished. I can just be here and guide her as good as I can. Yeah, exactly. And you know what has been so fun for me? I just want to point this out that like as adults we're used to this world right like we're kind of numb frequent i think we're frequently like out of touch with the magic of being alive yeah. in the universe on a planet like we with a beating heart in our chest like we lose touch with the magic we are and are experiencing but a child has not gotten numb hasn't gotten blind and nose blind to to the scent of life the perfume of the magic the child is in a state of awe and wonder and curiosity and exploration by nature they're sponges waiting to learn broadly it's natural to a kid it's natural to a kid to learn broadly and they're yeah. curious they yeah. ask why yeah. and then yeah. they ask why to that and then why to that they naturally do root cause analysis <laughs> okay absolutely it, it, it's like form follows function you know the form of big eyes moving around very quickly hands on everything it i mean that's that's the form and the function is learning by hands by seeing by tasting whatsoever uh, yeah but the wonderful thing is uh they have no how do you call this when they had the horses have these uh, um Bl these blinders oh, the blinders yeah they call part blinders. yeah yeah and they don't have that there is this wonderful uh, anecdote I love to tell about her. Uh, uh, it's most most of the time it's the icebreaker and the opener for conference talks because then everyone is like, oh yeah. Um, it was like Valentina and I, we were. It was summer. We were walking along the street. She had an ice cream in hand. Me too. Uh, and many people were. It was a crowded day uh, in the streets. And suddenly she was like <gasps> pointing with her finger right in the face of one of these uh, smaller guys uh i just know the, the medical term a little a little a, a little person um yeah a little person and she said oh, daddy look at that and i like reflex i took her hand no valentina and she looked at me and said what is it because he had no f what is it look at this his mustache he's what Oh, goodness me. Then I saw it. This guy had a wonderful fine print mustache in his face. Because he, as he was on eye level with Valentina, she didn't see the small person. She just see this wonderful, fantastic fine print mustache. And I just saw an idiot named Florian. <laughs> Honestly, this was one of the moments where I understood. Now... I have to sit down and everything when Valentina sees something or talks about something, listen. She sees the world completely as it is. If there is someone running around with, um, I don't know, yeah, with such a moustache, she sees the moustache. Uh, or if uh, a dog sits somewhere and uh, has turned out, and, uh, oh, he must be thirsty. Very clear where there are no blinders around. So... Uh, and then this was when I started to to note her favorite quotes, which didn't make much sense back then because the grammar is horror and and uh, yeah, they don't know what they are talking actually. Uh, but the funny thing was that when we were talking, when it was about abstract things, it was highly interesting to see how she managed to understand like uh, what is love, uh, what is what is uh, fear, what is uh, what is happiness. And with her, with this basic set of I don't know fifty words or something, uh, and her hands and her arms, she was 
very clear to explain to me what it is for her. Um, and um, the other thing was uh, when it came to like, this is a house, that is a, a river whatsoever, uh, it was like the pointing gesture everywhere. Yeah? Uh, and this was okay as well. And I understood back then that they already are in the position of being, mm, I always call Valentina like she is a nitwitess because she witnesses everything. And then as a nitwit as she is, comments on everything she sees if it is makes sense or not doesn't it, it, it doesn't matter it's just a reflection of what she actually sees and then i finally understood that they are already start combining things they already think in networks they already understand that they, they don't see a certain well, when there is i don't know what was this um when we were standing at an aquarium uh, she was not only seeing this one fish with one eye, or I don't know, something was wrong with this fish. She was seeing all the fishes and the connections and the network. Maybe this is the, the, the baby fish, this is the grandpa fish. Well, where is the doctor fish who takes care of this fish? So there is already this network thinking. It, it, it felt so naturally. And when I understood that she already thinks in these combinations and these patterns, uh, I completely stopped whatever I did and uh, thought I'm doing uh, in, in, in showing her, or training her whatsoever, and just gave her the lead. There is this wonderful thing what we always do. We, we, combine, uh, uh, we combine stuff like when we play uh, a, a board game, okay? We don't play it with these faceless figures, wooden, faceless wooden figures. We, we take legal characters. We take legal fig figures and play them, the board game with this, and suddenly a story evolves within this uh, play, within this board game, whatever it is about. And it's funny because suddenly the game itself um, hops in the background and the story is much more interesting. Why they are here now? Why do, why, why is, why, when, when I throw the dice and one character is allowed to, uh, let's take uh, snakes and ladders, why is one falling back and how can this other figure help him to come back to the same place and stuff like that? And, and, and this is what I think, she, she loves that kind of play because it's, it's, it's starting to, to combine many things, emotional stuff, there is this character, others that help, and it is a game somehow, and the life is a game itself as well, but you don't know the rules when you start. Someone gives you rules, you have intrinsic sets, rule sets, you get extrinsic rule sets. But uh, yeah, f f finally, it's, it's, it's just how you can reshape your inner rule, rule set to, to go your way as a polymath, because that's our major problem in a mono, in a mono uh, uh, mathic or, or very, very hyper specialized world. Uh, or the other thing that I love to do, still love to do, um, uh, when she sits down and draws uh, a picture, Right now, she's in the dinosaur phase. Uh, and, okay, let's draw dinosaurs and houses. And I sit there and draw exactly every little bit she draws. She draws first, I draw second. And suddenly I understand every, every bit has a meaning. Every, every triangle has a meaning. Every, every shade has a meaning. But we as, as adults, we just see, oh, yeah, this is a very colorful picture. No, it isn't. It has a very clear meaning, but no one asks them ever. So, for instance, when she draws a big dinosaur right there with such, and, and she plays this so wonderfully, what is this? And this dinosaur always has a name, even if it's a fantasy name, but it has a name, so she feels connected to it. And then somewhere is a tiny house next to the dinosaur. And I said, Oh, my love, why is this house so tiny? The dinosaur never fits in. And she said, Daddy. That house is far behind, somewhere at the horizon. Ah, of course. You know, that's the per per peripheric thinking and, and, and already the visual thinking. The house is somewhere there. That's because it's small. It's, it's somewhere far away. But we just see two-dimensional. They see three-dimensional, but we don't want to understand and see this. So, uh, or what else are we doing uh, in combined ways? Uh, for instance... Um, oh yeah, uh, playing memory, the, the, the card game, 
for the game, uh, and listening to, uh, uh, I don't know, Sleeping Beauty or some audiobook. And suddenly she comes up with, ah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Daddy, why did the prince kiss Sleeping Beauty? I said, yeah, to awake her. Yeah, but she didn't brush her teeth for 100 years. That's madness. I mean, bleh. and that's so fun, you know. And it was the first time when I understood if you combine one or two different things or, or contra contradictory things, it suddenly does something. Your mind has to, uh, or some or so subconscious mind listens, the other one. So many, all the senses, all the senses play with them, but not like forcing it. Like you have to listen now to get this and that. No, no, playful. Keep it story. It's story, story, story. It's always about the story. Yeah. <clears throat> so could you share with me a little bit more? Like, I'm curious, and I'd love to share what we've done for Lily as well, but like, what are some of the things that you've explored with her? Like, what are some of the things you've exposed her to out in the world? What is she yeah. like? Like, what is she not like? Like, what's her, her flavor of interests or combination? Um, I have two ways. I had two approaches, but one worked out better. The first one was um, that uh, I sat down and uh, showed her certain things in books in advance. Um, until I understood it was too soon. She's six and a half. With five and six years, books are nice, but it's too abstract to, uh, you know, go out to reality and see, oh, this was in the book and now it's the same in reality. I, for her, I don't know, maybe there are, there are definitely enough children out there who can do that. But for her, it wasn't not the right thing. Um, so I mixed it with activities. For instance, um, we often go to the Danube, to the riverside. And of course, there are certain dangers I have to keep an eye on. That she's not falling into the river, that she's not tasting some plants she doesn't know. Uh, that she uh, went, um, or so she helps me with with doing the fire, cooking, whatsoever. So I was thinking, uh, let's play it through at home. Okay. So we so the first thing we did after I bought the tent, uh, we built it here up in my flat. Uh, and instead of the fire stove, we just had a gas cooker, and then we just played it through. And by playing it through, it was no problem anymore outside because she had it in her hands. She understood to do this and that. Then for the uh, for the poisonous plants, uh, I colored some plants. Like I went to the grocery and colored some. I said, look at this. That, that, that's obviously salad, but it's red. Does it look right? No, it doesn't look right. Ah, then let's let's keep it. No, 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 no. Let's then put it away. Um, or uh, video games. Everyone was laughing at me, but there are wonderful uh, video games around on the Xbox uh, and, and definitely on the other other uh, consoles as well uh, about uh, playing together, you know, working together. There's a wonderful one. It's called, I think it's it's Unravel. Uh, these are two tiny figures which uh, are uh, connected to each other with a thread, a woolen thread, because the figures are of, of wool and no figure can move somewhere without the other one because there is a certain point of max extension of the wool. And um, playing these games, she finally understood, oh, we have to work together. And I think she was, it was after her sixth birthday, shortly after her sixth birthday, uh, when we were uh, in the woods, in the forest, when uh, she suddenly stood there and said, dad, give me, uh, give me the rucksack. Give me the, the, the smaller rucksack. I was a tiny small rucksack. That's my rucksack. That's my duty. Uh, that's mine now because we have to work together. Otherwise, you don't have any energy anymore. And then I don't find you because we don't have our wound thread. Oh, see, unbelievable. Thank you, my love. Um, and so bit by bit, um, she we are training this stuff. Or uh, in the evening, when she has this fear of, yeah, all, all children have this fear of, of darkness. Um, we we do we we uh, make it like adventurous. We take flashlights, and then we play like we are adventurers on a on a distant planet, foreign planet whatsoever, alien world. And now we have to look everywhere. Oh goodness, that's a snake! No, it's your socks. 
uh, oh no, what's this? Oh, that's your underpants. And so <laughs> she said, is this this time the idea behind this to do um to create curiosity out of fear? Mm. There is no fear, there is no anxiety. In the very moment where you make it curious, where you make it a play, it suddenly becomes uh, wow, <gasps> what's this? What's that? What is is there more of it? Mm. Of course, there are enough things where she by herself says, ah, that's too dangerous. I don't want to do that. And if I hear this, and if I feel it isn't right now, then we say stop. Learning swimming. All the girls around her already can swim and hop into the pool. She doesn't want you to hop into the pool because she always got the nose full of water. And I didn't pressure her, no forcing. Why? Well, we always went to the pools, went to the pools. And suddenly she said, I want to try it now. I said, okay, well, then let's just, let's think it through. I want to try it. No, no, let's think it through. Nose closed, mouth closed, eyes closed, hop. Mouth closed, eyes closed, hop. Mouth closed, eyes closed, hop. Huh? Blatch. There it was. The first hop. And she was so super fascinated and so happy about herself and her courage that she did it, I think, 40 times, which was a really good evening because she slept around six-ish. <laughs> um, <but laughs> you know what I mean? It's like always she has the lead. It's not like I have her on a leash. Right. She has to lead. And we are we are connected through this thread, which all parents are, this, you know, thread from heart to heart, but also an emotionally one and a trust. I never tell her uh, it's it's bedtime, seven o'clock, brush your teeth. It's your decision. The only thing I want before I read the bedtime story that you just give me an hug. <laughs> And if it doesn't uh, smell like peppermint, we have an issue. So <laughs> it's like do it passively, do it indirectly. She understands, but she's not forced. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think the crucial point is that I force myself every day in the morning and in the evening when she's around not to use but. Always to use and. It's not like, no, yes, but we don't do that. Or I don't do that. It's not like, uh, you have a wonderful idea, but no. Because the very moment I use but, everything I said before, uh, you can forget. But if I say and, it suddenly becomes for her more, ah, I can do that too. And I had this wonderful moment. There is a remake of uh, a song from Sting, uh, a classic like I think Fields of Gold, and there is now a remixture whatsoever. And it's horrible. sorry if one of the producers here, but it's sorry for my soul, it's horrible. Uh, it's with a beat and so forth, and blah blah blah. blah. Yeah, um, so we were sitting in the car, and this was played. Uh, this song was played, and I said, Well, do you like it? And she said, Yeah, it's different. I said, Okay, now I play the original. Because I had emotional connection to the original one. First kisses and so on. You know, you know. <laughs> so uh, I played the original from Sting. And while my heart was going off. And she said, mm, well, yeah. I said, what? Isn't this better? And she said, because we never use but. I like both. I like this and that. And this was, the very, this was a key moment where I understood it works. Because she's not drawn to one side. And I said, okay, why? Why do you like both? And she said, yeah, the one song you played first, I like the rhythm and the beat because I like drums. The other one, I like the voice better. So it's not like I hate, to, I'm just on one side. It's like I'm on both sides and why not? And that's a crucial thing. Um, the why and why not question. I really, I gave it a long thought, two years. When is the best moment in a situation to, when the why comes up, and we all know there is always the why. Why do we do that? Why do I have to? If you say, why not? Why not can we do that? This is the moment where everything stops. Like for a six-year-old child, what, why not? What do you mean with why not? Yeah, of course we can do it. What, really? Sure. We just have to think through in advance. Oh, yeah, okay, 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 okay. Then let's do that. Because the wish to do it is much stronger than the why. 
Hmm. Thank you for sharing all that. What, what fun stories. You seem like such a good dad. Um, for Lily, I, I have really tried to give her a generous uh, sampling of all the things that she can enjoy in life. And she's a busy girl. She has a busy calendar. It started even when she was still an infant. I think when she was about six months old, I signed up. She couldn't even crawl yet. I signed up for mommy and me swim class. And so I began to expose her to the, the swimming pool. And she was a little bit scared of it. But as long as I was holding her, she was okay. And uh, I think when she was two, we did so we did dance. We did soccer. Um, she has taken, God, she's taken so many different classes and less dance, gymnastics. She's in karate right now. She's done Girl Scouts. She's done Boy Scouts. Um, God, she's an excellent ice skater. Um, she has a skateboard, a bike and rollerblades and, oh gosh, what else? I feel like I'm forgetting so many things, but like the, the method I've done has like, okay. So like she takes a lot of classes, uh, outside of school and there's been engineering club and drama club and all these things that her school offers extra that she loves to do. She loves to be at school. She hates school, but she loves it too because her friends are there and there's sometimes like, she loves recess. School has been difficult for her because it's so slow because she doesn't like to just wait while other people are figuring things out. Um, I've also traveled quite a bit with her like since she was about two, I mean, I think Lily's passport probably has at least six or seven countries on it. And she's seven years old. Uh, it's been really important for me, not just to expose her to activities or to learning, but to people, to the real world, to different cultures, to different ways of thinking. I don't view, I mean, obviously I want to pr protect my child, um, but I want her to understand the real world and not live too much in a make-believe fantasy existence of reality like i it, it's a balance right. of like sheltering her and exposing her and providing a safe place you know um when she needs to retreat to mom or dad and her dad and i are divorced now i know you also went through a divorce so that's been part yeah. of the journey as well as like co-parenting and um but yeah i mean i really try to give her as much agency and choice as i can because i want her to learn how to think there's a part of me when she argues with me and doesn't want to do something I've asked her to do. There's a part of me that's like, I want her to listen to me. And then there's a part of me that's like secretly proud that she can think enough for herself to offer an yeah. argument with her own perspective in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we get so programmed, like kids are sort of in this, especially girls are, you know, the age of our daughters they're, you know, six, seven years old, they're not fully indoctrinated, propagandized, commoditized, brainwashed, like all of that hasn't happened to them yet. And yeah. so they're in this beautiful, like, period before the world has has made them and they're still making they're making themselves. And I hope as long as I can to shelter my daughter from the world making her and allow her to self author and self express who she is without too much influence, including my own influence from the outside, because I want her to really be who she is in her own choice of of what that looks like. So um, because I want her to learn how to think and be independent. Um, there's so much wisdom too, that we can learn from young people, you know, like I love one of my favorite things to do is just like, ask my daughter a question. I have no idea how she'll answer. I have no idea if the question's too big or too mature for her seven-year-old brain, but I love to just ask her. And I'm frequently shocked at the level of wisdom and insight that my child has. Yeah. yeah I see you nodding your head there. Um, they, she learns so much through play too, and, and being creative, like the, and the, you know, polymathy being a broad, versatile, capable person is associated with creativity. And you know, what else is so associated with creativity is play, which is like the kid, what kids love to do. They love to play. And our society is sort of built around like limiting their play, right? They got to do work. They got to go to their, their career at school. 
for 18 years. It's it's a grind. They're in a grind, a career grind. It's a, the school grind. Um, and it's I know that's difficult, but play is a relief to the burdens of responsibilities, right? So I love to see her play. She's taken piano lessons. I forgot that. She's gone to music camp. Um, she's done so many cool things and she loves it. Like she's just a happy little girl, you know? That's right. Um, what else should we talk? Has Val shared like any thoughts on school? Like how is school for her? Um, she isn't in school right now because she's a September child. Okay. Uh, so we decided oh, right. to give her one more year of childhood, but she already was at the school uh, for, yeah, you know, checking who's around and who she will be in class with. And um, it's fun. I, I was so happy because she has a, fr a, a friend, Esil Tuna. She's uh, from a Turkish family. Her mother has a PhD in chemistry. Uh, her father is uh, in Austria since he's 11 years old. He's a manager. Um, and uh, they are very, very strict with the training of, her, of the girls. Um, and there is, you know, there is a little. They are friends, but there is already so this this tiny rivalry between them. Hmm. So when I when I go to the kindergarten with Valentina by bike, and she's like, oh, go 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 by bike, I said, oh, Esil Tuna is already there with bike. What baby? <laughs> <laughs> no, she is okay. So uh, we managed. Uh, we the parents managed that they both will sit next to each other on the same desk. Um, and I was so happy. But I, I had some parents around who said, oh, yeah, these are the cultures, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, I think you have them everywhere around the world. But in this very moment, I was so happy because she, with, with, this, with this girl as friend, a complete new culture and world opens up for her. A new language, new interpretations, new solutions to problems. I mean, mm -hmm. just take Japan. Look at Japan, how they solve things, even in design. They have paper walls. I mean, come on. No one could have paper walls around here, but they do it with paper. Or fishing. They have those those birds, those cormorants, hopping down, and they have a, a rope around the neck. And then they put the, the bird back and take the fish out of the of the beak. We have, we have this, uh, uh, throw it in and wait, wait, wait. No, they have a very natural, biological way to do it. So there are always other solutions around for the problems. And I think that is one of the major things um, children have to learn when they want to grow up in a, in a polymathic philosophy, understanding of the world. I don't know how to put it. Um, to understand patterns, to understand problems, and to find ideas in the patterns they already seen. Mm. I give you an example. Some will hate me for this, uh, but... I've seen with well every Disney movie already and nearly an every animation movie in the last one and a half years. They are 90 minutes. I, I know it's just 30 minutes, but we are talking about a lot. And it's just like, you know, a theater play for us. And there is this movie. So afterwards, we are discussing what happened and how she felt. Now, as she has seen nearly all of the print Disney princesses and whatsoever, uh, she already has a certain archive mm -hmm. of solutions and of problems and how to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. And mm, I, I already had it twice when she told me a story about the kindergarten where two children were quarreling or where one of the teachers were, were, were uh, um, quarreling with, uh, with a child. And it, it, it is like exactly in this movie where the father says this and that to the boy, but just with girls, but it was the same. So she takes these stories like she understands them as if they were real. And my latest understanding of novels, of stories, uh, written fictional stuff, um, is like it's qualitative research. Everyone who writes a novelist who sits down and writes a novel is actually a qualitative researcher because he takes all the stuff and, and finds these in-between quality things in certain situations. Um, and it doesn't matter if it is science fiction or fantasy or thriller or mystery. It doesn't, doesn't matter. It is qualitative research. Now, Val has this set, this movie set of qualitative research in behind where certain situations are thought through and okay here comes 
the horrible thing about me, um, fairy tales. I have had it with fairy tales. I can't see them anymore. And I can't read to her a story about a young girl with seven dwarfs. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, always a prince hops around and saves them. Come on. There is no fairy tale around. Where is it the other way around? Yes, there is. It's called Alien. Brilliant movie, 1979, where suddenly the princess kills the dragon. Sigourney Weaver place. took care yes. of it. Yeah. Exactly. She killed the dragon and all the princes die. Hmm? Yeah. We Love that movie. <laughs> we have to remember that. Yeah, this was a, ooh. <laughs> this was a big game changer. Mm. Um, but I have uh, fairy tales are, yeah, they are too cozy. Uh, these these uh, uh, highly, how can I put it? These movies are edited often. They, they have certain stories. They have certain understanding. They would convey uh, certain feelings, emotions, solutions. They are good. They are really, really good. Um, and uh, they give them, they give children this set of understanding of the world because they play in the now. They, they, they handle now problems, not uh, how do I brush my t-shirt for 100 years or cut my no tails because I'm sleeping beauty. And how, can, how beauty can you be? Yeah, I know it's a magical sleep, but it doesn't make sense in my head. And actually, uh, and that's the funny thing, uh, well, in her very clear and simple way of seeing the world, simple, not meant negatively, simple and just clear, um, already starts to find patterns herself, fractals. She doesn't know the word and she has no idea what it is. And I don't want to tell her because she has to find out for herself. Fractals like that it's interesting. Why does a broccoli look the same like a tall tree? Dad, why has a tree so much branches? It looks the same like blood vessels. Dad, I've seen a picture of brain neurons in a book. And then I say, okay, have you ever seen the stars in the Milky Way? They are connected the same way. If you see the pictures, it's nearly the same. <gasps> Do we live in a big brain? Who is thinking me? And then suddenly these ideas come, but it's pattern recognition. We, we just don't talk about idea synthesis. It's too soon. This will come later on. But starting to understand that certain things uh, have similar or equal um, phenotypes, certain emergings from nowhere to reality, or even the understanding that with uh, doing craft, craft things, that you can realize what's in your head, that you can, you can make real what's in your head. You can make your dreams become true. You can make your ideas become physical. And these are so many things that are interconnected. And even if you can't tell the children, uh, yeah, it's interconnected, it's a highly interesting thing because network and blah, blah, blah. Just point to it, name it just once. And I always let Val interpret things first. I never do an interpretation first. I always ask, what do you think about it? How does it feel for you now? And she says, yeah, I don't like it or something like, um, uh, I don't think it's any good or this and that person is bad. Well, if you think it now, it's right now. But you will see, the more you learn and understand, you will see it from other perspectives. And then you might find it okay or not. And when it becomes too complicated, I can see it in her eyes because then it's like, uh, and it's okay, okay, okay. That's enough for today. Lessons learned. And it's really like doing this all in tiny bits and pieces, um, keeping a process, keeping the flow, you know, every day a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, a few other things I'd like to mention and or ask about. Um, so basically, I think what, what you and I are both summarizing is that we've tried to enhance the learning that our kids engage in to make sure it's, it's, appropriate but but not unnecessarily limited like we let them explore what they're curious about we give them a sampling period 
right? Yes. <laughs> Honestly, I think the sampling period should never end. I think we sh humans, even when we're old, should always have the freedom to go try whatever we feel like trying. But it's especially important early on, don't you think? I think it's even harsher for us because we have so much responsibility around as parents and as, as grown-ups who have to earn money or have to pay bills. I mean, come on, honestly, the most cruel thing in my life was my divorce because there was no narrative for what is after this. What is afterwards? The narrative is you marry your prince or your princess and live happily ever after. There is no fairy tale around where prince and princess get divorced and had to split the castle. Good Lord, there is no story about this. So then you'd, or it doesn't have to be a divorce. It can be a death. Your partner dies. How to move on, how to live on. There is no story about this. Yeah, there are some ideas, but there is no clear narrative. Now you can do this and that to be happy again. That's, uh, that's the thing that psychologists have to do then. And I mean, that's wicked because how can a, co a society, a community, a culture live with such mono-way uh, uh, narratives from A to B, born to death? I mean, is this really humane? No, something gets lost in that narrative for sure. And one other thing I'd like to address as well, because I know, like, as I've described how I have chosen to parent Lily, it's included things that cost money right? Like I've had the resources to take her on trips or sign her yeah. up for some classes. And I do that. And I know not all parents are in a position to be able to, you know, have the, the disposable income to do those things. Not ever. And some, some have much more than I have. Right. But I think the point is not that like, you must have money to s send them to swim class. You know, the point is like, find ways to let your child learn about as many things so they can find what they really like and and to not say something like you're gonna learn violin and you're gonna stick to it even if you don't like it because that's how you're gonna get good at it and I want you to play violin like that is not a recommended yeah. parenting style for someone who wants to elicit a happy healthy well-balanced child so I just want to address the resources issue there you know there are libraries there are places to take your child to community activities for free. There are videos on the internet. Like there are so many different ways to learn. And if you have the resources, okay, great. And if you don't, we'll figure out the workarounds, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why, I mean, honestly, my, my apartment uh, is, uh, you can't see this right now here, but I have certain places like in uh, Da Vinci's uh, uh, craft shop. I have a certain place where all the uh, music instruments, musical instruments are. Uh, there are tiny drums, stuff like that. There, and there, I have a place here for drawing and painting. I have a, a, a certain place for reading um, and and writing, drawing, you know. So uh, Val can move around here whenever she has an idea. She can use it interchangeably. Because actually that is what she does in kindergarten anyway. They can do anything what they want. And that's how it should be, even for us as grown-ups, because the very much, I mean, this was just a funny story. Agatha Christie, most famous Agatha Christie, always came up with the brilliant with her plots when she was washing the dishes. So we, we are not. She was not like sit down like Schiller or Goethe, and oh, then I have this wonderful poem. Uh, this epistone of brilliancy put into into words forever and ever. No, I mean th th she was washing the dishes and suddenly had an idea. Default um, mode and... network. Default yes. mode network. That's what that's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Or my, my my favorite thing when I'm discussing stuff with my oh you're mirroring in this. I know. I saw uh... that. I was like, oh, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, something like this. Suddenly seeing something understanding something and naming it in the very moment it happens yeah it just gives you a new idea but when i'm discussing with my students uh this was quite fun it was one uh, lecture at the university and i met a lot of medicine students uh and we were talking about uh, communication physician patient communication um and two of them were just playing around with the with the cell phone permanently and i say what are actually what are you doing 
I'm just talking. I'm just telling you the story. Just sit and listen. I mean, it's better than a podcast. It's for free. Uh, okay, podcasts are for free too, but I'm in 3D. Um, and then one guy said, uh, one of the, uh, the students said, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, checking stuff because the internet opens my world. And I said, are you sure? I said, why not? There is all information I need. I said, no, 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 no. You just said it opens your world. What do you mean with this? Yeah, it makes it bigger. I, I just know more things then. I said, how in God's name can you know more when you reduce your five senses just to two by reading and listening? And now even you don't listening, you're just reading. So you're actually just using one sense, reading, because you don't even feel something when touching. So how can your world open up when you reduce your senses to one? I don't get it. Now, this was quite interesting to see the faces uh, because they suddenly became aware, oh, ooh. of course, there is Wittgenstein saying that um, the more words, uh, the bigger my world knowledge, the bigger my world is. Yes, this is true. But uh, what kind of words? What exactly makes it better or 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 more? I don't know. You can so may, say so many things with just 100 words. I think you can even learn every language or speak nearly every language with 100 words. Now, here's the question. When does a child has 100 words together? And what does it mean? Is her world then already finished? Is it done? Does she need more words? Because everything she connects with her inner world. And if it works for her, isn't it good enough then? Hmm. So um, these are all things and situations to, to not keep in mind, but they are permanently flowing in my background and in my subconscious. Something pops up now and then, you know, it's like quantum mechanics here. Oh, there is a, there is a, that is a, there is a, so my problem is more than calming it down and keep everything calmed down to see and observe what my daughter does with the world around her. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, I see so many things where I think, oh my goodness, that's exactly it. It's just that. Sitting here and playing cards is just what it has to be now, not more. Having hot chocolate and playing cards and fun, that's it. That's the moment. Bam. Mm -hmm. No further thinking. Yeah. So it is, you know, it's both ways. Right. One other thing I want to ask your opinion on, I don't think we've ever discussed this before, but I was born in the early 1980s. I think you and I are around the same age. I'm 42, almost 43. And I come from the old world. I come from the pre-internet, pre-cell phone world where kids just played outside by themselves and parents weren't around all the time. And it was a different world. So I'm now faced with the challenge of raising a human being in a world I didn't grow up. I didn't grow up in the world with the internet, you know, with YouTube, with Netflix. And so, and there's like studies that show that like early exposure could be detrimental to brain development and, you know, and there, and then there's this other philosophy, which is like, well, they're going to grow up in a world filled with tech. And so you want them to be early adopters and, and digital natives so that they know how to function in that space. And it's been really tricky for me to kind of navigate how much screen time do I let my kid have? And she loves the screen time and she learns a lot from it. To be honest, like a lot of her learning has taken place on YouTube. And I I'm like, yeah, mom please. shame, sorry, sorry. Like, I don't know if that was a mistake, yeah. but I do know that she learns words and concepts and stuff. And I'm like, where did that come from? She's just a sponge following her yeah. own curiosities. And so I'm curious, like, as a dad, what what have you decided with regard to screen time? Screen time. Um, like movies and uh, tablets. Let me put it like this. We, we already live in an empire of screens. Right. I mean, lately I, 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 I counted them. I think I have seven or eight screens around which is absurd because I just can look in one, right? Right. So, um, and it is true that uh, 
when they grow up, they these are the first things they see around and what it is, what it shows and what you can see in there. Um, and I always, I kind of, I, I, I have to laugh about it because uh, when I see a nice science fiction movie and there are children around and they know all these brilliant words and all these tech words and all these techno bubble, you know, I'm like, oh, that are, these are clever children. But the very moment I hear my own daughter talking like this, it's like, no, you will look watching too much TV. Isn't it a bit, I mean, uh, okay. So I think like with it, it is for me, as you said, I was born 77. So I was completely analogous. My childhood was completely, but I always was like interested in, you know, in the 80s cyberpunk, we were already dreaming about hmm, what would it be when there is a computer, when we can phone and talk to each other by a computer. Now we are actually doing it. So I live in the future I read back then. Mm -hmm. The only thing I think is um, screen time. Uh, there are certain studies around that say 30 minutes, it's, uh, uh, you know, a rule of thumb for watching alone. Mm. Mm. because no study ever checked what is actually what actually happens when you watch together and funnily enough there was a study last year i think a rather big one long to the nail study uh where they uh, where they said when parents watch together with children uh it actually doesn't matter it shouldn't overdo it with uh, 90 minutes like a classical movie or something like this but watching together having fun together there is no big difference uh, like uh, going to the theater. Oh, yeah, of course, I know this, like I see real people play and so, but it is something you do together. And when you talk about the story afterwards, honestly, I see no harm because as you said, uh, most of the stuff I learned for myself, I learned via screen. And mm -hmm. I think it's more like uh, if you forbid it, they want it anyway. If you say, let's do it together and let's see together what we can, is this interesting? Is it not interesting? It's like, uh, you know, like the caveman said, darling, these uh, uh, pink berries are not good for you. You will die. It's like showing the environment, the world around them. And now it's like these internet pages are crap. You don't have to look at them. Now, these YouTube channels are good because the guy or the, the girl or the whoever does it has a profound knowledge and it's true. So I think in our in our digital age, it's more about uh, uh, separating which what content is quality and what not. Mm -hmm. And after all, I think that's the most crucial point. Yeah, they have to learn for themselves when saturation point is reached and stop for themselves. Val already has it, nearly, with six and a half. She gets bored after three or four episodes, even of her favorite uh, uh, series. After three or four episodes, she gets bored, like, mm, I've seen enough now, it's okay, let's play cards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's not like me saying, uh, oh, darling, come on, turn it off. It's like saturation point reached. Yeah. I have my stories now for today. That's nice. Uh, I know Daddy will read two or three stories uh, in the evening at bedtime. So I have my story, story accumulated field mm -hmm. eh? uh, or my story memory sp uh, space field. And that's good for me. And I think that's the point that we should train with them. When is the point to turn it off? I don't know if you can remember, there was this brilliant, really innovative and brilliant series, uh, Max Headroom, mm -hmm. at the end of the 80s. I don't know MTV. why it's not, exactly. I don't know why it is not showing up anymore. You can buy it, but it was genius. It was called 20 Minutes into the Future. Uh, and they had, they, had this, they had this world where uh, uh, all screens didn't have an off button. They just put the blankets over the screens and they were still moving because everyone who watched uh, and, and all the adverts uh, were bringing in money. So as long as the TV set was running and adverts were running, the big stations had money. That was the idea. So there wasn't even a, a, a turn off button anymore. Imagine that. That's brilliant. Because how often do you really turn off your phone? 
right now or, or a screen. And that's where the moment where I understood this is the superpower of the future. This is real understanding of what is necessary and splitting between fantasy and or, or digital world and reality. Turn it off. But no one trains anyone to turn it off. Turn it or off. Understand Balance. Your inner, your, your inner feeling of I've seen enough for today. Well, it's okay. It's yeah. like with binge eating, binge drinking, binge eat whatsoever, binge watching. I mean, absurd. That's that's the, the skills we have to train our children in the future. Turn it off. Yeah. And yeah, and it's interesting for me, my screen time is almost all on my phone. Or if I have a meeting, I'll get on my computer. But I hate sitting at a computer and I don't watch much TV because I'm too busy. So I think we all learn to like find our balance point and like learn what we want to learn about and hear about and watch about and what we don't, you know, like. I don't want to watch certain things. I don't want certain inputs. And so I am my own filter and my own sensor. And I think kids learn to do that too, right? Yeah. And although That's parents may need to mentor with some of that. Yeah. I think we, 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 we are too fearful and too anxious with this because our mindset is in the, in, 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 in the, in the past because we always compare it to our past, to our youth, yeah? Uh, it's actually their youth now. Their youth is full of YouTube and Netflix and screens and funny games and so forth. But we have no, absolutely no research results or understanding what these children do when they are 15 or 20. I mean, Facebook is dying. No one is interested in Facebook anymore. Uh, they are doing TikTok now. Yes, of course, there will always be some certain social uh, place uh, stuff around. But the moment when... Uh, now, stuff's going on like climate change and so forth, or affording uh, uh, a TV set or Netflix success or whatsoever. <clears throat> there will be a certain point when it will be, uh, things will downgrade. Or the content, who will create the content in the future when everyone retires? We will see all the same faces. And honestly, the moment when there are just AI movies out there, or just AI-generated characters... I bet that many, 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 even young people will say no, mm -hmm. because it's not true. Yeah. Um, I have a couple other quick questions I sure. want to ask as we begin to wrap up. Um, so you're thoughtfully and res I would say respectfully parenting. Like the, the old school role of parenting was the parent told you do what yeah. I say you do you do it because I said it I don't need to tell you why yeah. you, I'm in yeah. charge of you you are my slave you are my minion that yeah. was like the yeah. old school mentality I would say a more modern and healthy and holistic and humane way of parenting is to treat them like they're a human being treat them like yeah. you want to be treated res with respect yeah. right so that's another one of the like fundamental ethos underscoring how. I parent, but I want to ask you, like, what do you want the impact you have on Valentina to be long-term? Like what, what, how will you know your parenting has been successful? Like what is success as a parent to you? I have to ask my future, Florian. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a big question. Um, yeah, that's a really big question because I just can answer, do I have to? Isn't it a process after all? Because I yes. evolve and I become another person anyways. True. Her True. doings and not doings. But I just make it for some key factors. Uh, one, one key factor would be um, when she uh, clearly can decide that she can turn off the telly or the screen when she wants to because she understands it isn't good for me anymore. Uh, if she insists of doing social stuff, like playing theater, like do, going to gym classes, like playing music, stuff like that. So be in the real world. Mm. Uh, then uh, be, be trustful and give trust. Be respectful and give respect. Um, and uh, no, yeah, maybe that's, that would be the best thing. The major goal for me is, if there is a goal, but you know, everything is way, um, when she understands that her only way to be safe is knowledge. 
and that gaining knowledge is not a horrible, terrible thing, but fun. When she understands that there are so many similar things outside in the world and that with one or two memory techniques, she can learn everything and stay curious. Uh, and then it is because then the rest, like uh, society thinking, like the wish for change and stuff like that comes in itself uh, when they turn after uh, puberty, between 20 and 30, you want to change the world. That's okay. That's brilliant. But until there, I think I think that's the point. When after puberty, six, 17, 18 years old, uh, when she is at this point and knows, I know where to get my knowledge that I need. I know to get high quality knowledge. Uh, it's the same with nutrition. And that's what I want to tell her. If you have high high quality nutrition, your body will work and you will be happy. And it's the same with knowledge and content. If you have high quality content, your brain will be happy. Mm. Your brain is a wonderful part of your body. Um, and it needs exercise. And, it needs to be needs used exercise. or you exactly. lose the ability to use it. Exactly. And that, that there is no situation whatsoever to have fear for of and, and to be anxious about because you can always ask someone. You can learn your you way know, through go problems. Go to someone and ask him, oh, I have this fear now of the world is going down or that I get cancer with 17 years. Okay, there are people you can ask. You can do, that's, I, I think that's the combination. Yeah. Learn where to get, get new, uh, new high quality knowledge, still stay curious and don't fear anything because everyone was through everything in history and mankind once. You just have to find this one person who already was there. Yeah. Go there, ask. Learn. Because to put it in a nutshell, that's exactly what we still are since we were cavemen. We were sitting around the fireplace in the evening. One guy comes back from the jungle, completely scratched, sits down, has a drink, and says, you can't believe what happened to me. And everyone is listening. And from this story, everyone knows, oh, seems there is some beast on the way three kilometers from here. Better not go there. Let's think about how to keep everything safe around. It's knowledge, high quality, uh, high quality knowledge creation. It's everything is in this tiny story. And we don't have to fear it because someone was there and already seen it. Because we only fear what we can't see and what we don't have names for. Mm. That's basically yeah, what I think. Yeah, I love that. Some of the things I, I, for me, that I would view as my standards for success as a parent are... Does my kid know I unconditionally love and support her? Like, has that become clear? I want my kid to have that secure attachment because I know attachment theory, one of my favorite theories to be securely attached or an indication that a child and an adult is securely attached is that they know they have a safe place. They know they have a parent who loves them and cares for them, which allows them the confidence and bravery to go out into the world try scary things and then know if they need comfort, yes. they have a place to come back to. So I want my daughter to know she has a safe place and to have the confidence and bravery to do daring things, to be herself, to try things, to face her yeah. fears. So that's part of it for me. Another measure of success is, can she be considerate of other people? Like, can she cooperate in a collective? You know, I don't want her to over conform right? But I want her to be able to get along. I don't want to raise a psychopath or a sociopath or a narcissist. So I really try to ingrain in her and she knows it and she acts like it, but other people matter too. Another measure of success would for me would be, does she feel like she's reaching her potential or working towards her best self? Um, I don't want my kid to feel like her talent and potential in the world is squashed and wasted, right? And also just her knowing that it's okay to change. It's okay to yeah. evolve. Like who she yeah. is today might not be exactly who she is 10 yeah. years from now. And that's great. Like I yeah. believe that if a life is well lived, the more you experiment and try and change and maneuver your way through life, that you end up becoming a better self. You end up becoming a better version of yourself the more you learn and try. Now, some people can make their, their selves and their lives worse. 
but that's a life not well lived. If you're devolving into a worse version of yourself, then that is not a well lived life. A, a sign of a successful life is when you're imp regularly improving and upskilling yourself. And you do that through learning, right? Do you want to say I, something? I, I, yeah, I, I like how you brought this up now because uh, I actually, I already had this in mind because there there, there is this moment where, um, how can I put this? Where you're pushed off the throne as a parent, when you suddenly understand that not everything you said is as you said it, that there are many things you said just to keep them safe, um, that there are so many magical stories you told them that are not true. And I think that's a crucial moment. And I want this, it's a transition moment, a transformative moment for the relationship and for the both person. And I want this to be a very, it shouldn't be too rough. It shouldn't be too smooth. It should be clear. So <clears throat> I have I have a discussion with some parents now and then. Oh, we just tell our, our, our children the, uh, the real thing. They always have the real thing. Yeah. There is no Easter bunny. There is no Christmas. Uh, just keep it real. And I said, why? You take a very, very... A, a, a real essential experience from them. They have to understand, they have like the oh, wow moment, they have this aha moment as well to evolve. They have to hop over this, over this, um, they, they, they have to have to, they, they have to take this step. They have to hop over this limit. They have to hop over this like a threshold. Border, this, this threshold of, of, oh, it's not true, and have to work it out then. Because it is... Well, we're frozen, everybody. Sorry about that. I don't know if Flo has lost his internet connection, but we've been going a long time, so maybe I'll wrap it up. If we don't hear back from Flo. Um, one of the things I'll, I'll share actually while he's frozen is um, one of the other things I've done with my daughter and it's in process right now is I've written a children's book related to Polly Mathy and um, I drafted it and my daughter edited it. So we're going to be co-authors on a children's book. Um and the last thing I was going to ask Flo, um, I'm going to skip it. It was I was going to ask Flo if he wanted to say anything to his daughter in the future. Um, and I guess maybe I could do that. I could say what I what I would want my kid to hear from me if she ever sees this as an older person, which is just that. Oh God, am I going to get emotional? <laughs> um, I hope that my daughter feels like I mothered her well that I enriched her life, that I empowered her to be her authentic self. Um, and that she knew I loved her. She always knows that'll, that'll always be there. So anyway, I'm getting emotional now having a mama moment. Um, sorry, we lost flow there, but we've been, we covered so much ground today and we were getting ready to wrap up anyway. So I think I'm going to end it here. Thank you for watching all of this. I hope, it, you know, for anyone who has children, I hope that this was interesting and insightful and maybe gave you some ideas for ways that you can, um, you know, experiment with your own parenting approaches and refine how you do it. All right. That's all. Everyone have a good day. Thanks for watching. Bye.